Hello, Metals and Markets listeners and viewers out there. I'm traveling this Friday, May 10th, 2019, and consequently, this week's interview was recorded a few days prior on Wednesday, May 8th, 2019. The gold and silver markets thus far this week have been moving mostly sideways, even as trade discussions with China seem to be breaking down and the threat of increased tariffs, a very realistic and soon possibility. The silver spot price is trading just under $15 an ounce, while the gold spot price is hovering around the $1,284 per troy ounce level in Fiat Federal Reserve notes. The gold-silver ratio is still historically high, around the 86 level. This week, we're welcoming a first-time guest to the show, a man with multiple decades of investing experience and documentation of the precious metal markets, Mr. Ed Steer. He will join us in a few short seconds, but first, we have a new free silver coin offer for the first time ever from the sponsor of our show. Take advantage of this collaboration between the Royal Mint and SD Bullion while supplies last. SD Bullion and the Royal Mint have partnered together to offer silver investors a free 2019 Royal Mint Silver Britannia coin. Simply visit sdbullion.com forward slash free and when you purchase 24 2019 Royal Mint Silver Britannia coins, you'll receive the 25th silver coin for free. Your coins will be shipped in sealed Royal Mint tubes and boxes now because this offer is only available while supplies last. To get your free 2019 Royal Mint Silver Britannia coin, visit sdbullion.com forward slash free today. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets podcast. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. With us this week, a first-time guest to the show, he's Mr. Ed Steer of Ed Steer's Gold and Silver Digest. Hey, Ed, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me, James. Well, if you wouldn't mind, Ed, just for our listeners who may not know of you, how did you get involved in the precious metal markets in the first place? Well, when I first got a computer, which was back in 1999, which seems like it's 20 years ago now, uh, the first thing, uh, one of the first things I did was I stumbled across what was going on in the gold market because I used to be a big gold bug back when um, the hunt by this tried to corner the silver market. And of course, uh, what I did was I stumbled across uh, uh, GATA mm-hmm. and Bill Murphy's uh, La Metropole Cafe. And I, I followed that for a number of years. And then um, in about 2002, um, I started reading Ted Butler's work on uh, um, goldeagle.com. And uh, one thing read, led to another, and I started writing the odd thing for Bill Murphy and for Gata. And then in about 2007 or eight, I can't remember exactly when, I was invited to be on the board of Gata. Mm-hmm. And uh, starting about 2009, uh, Casey Research, uh, Doug, uh, David Galland of Casey Research asked me to start writing a column for them, which I did. And that lasted until um, Casey Research sold out to Porter Stansbury. And then I went on my own and I've been writing my column uh, uh, for the last four years on my own. And it's, um, it's uh, doing very well. And uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a 20 year journey. So I wanted to swing it back maybe today to, to more current precious metal market related topics. Um, what did you take away from the final Bart Chilton interview before his passing away this the late March? I think the interview was recorded with Chris Marcus. Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, when I when I heard it, uh, I was absolutely amazed. And like Ted, uh, we just couldn't figure out why uh, Bart, who was obviously under some sort of uh, oath of secrecy of, of, at the CFTC, would come forward and in public would basically confirm everything that Ted has accused J.P. Morgan of since 2008. And uh, I was flabbergasted. And of course. Once we got the shocking news, I think it was last week that Bart had passed, then it suddenly became clear that uh, he didn't want this on his conscious, uh, conscience uh, uh, before, he, before he passed, and uh, he spilled the beans to Chris. I think it was absolutely awesome that he did that, 
very courageous the last act for a man and um it it's proof positive of course that uh, the silver price management scheme along with the other precious metals is uh, is been going on for a long time and uh uh all the non believers out there um if they ever listen to this uh, this interview would uh would would concur mm-hmm. And what do you think is happening regarding the continued delay um, by the U.S. Department of Justice and their prosecution of John Edwards and other potential directors at J.P. Morgan's Precious Metals Trading Desk? Well, I'll tell you what, James, that is a really good question, isn't it? Um, I was uh, very encouraged uh, when he did get charged, I think it was last November or October. Mm-hmm. And then there was supposed to be a quick sentencing date, I think it was December 19th, and of course that got pushed ahead to June, and now it's been pushed ahead to December. Um, it doesn't make me over, overly optimistic, but um, Ted Butler is more than optimistic that maybe that they're continuing their investigation into J.P. Morgan and the silver price uh, market manipulation. And uh, to tell you the truth, um, I'm personally not happy about it, but uh, we'll just have to see where this leads. Nobody really knows for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what surprised you, I would say, the most? I mean, in the last, especially the last 10 years, things have just gotten so crazy in the financial markets. What what things have surprised you the most, just off the top of your mind? You know, if you read, I'm a student of history, financial history, and if you go back to the South Sea bubble and the Louisiana Purchase and all this crazy stuff that went on, the tulip mania of the 1600s, and you put that template against what you see in say for, versus 1929 in the US when the crash came I see direct and distinct parallels to that as a matter of fact I consider them to be identical except for the fact that a this one is 10 times as big and it not only just involves single countries like it did England or Holland or France um, it involves the entire global financial and economic system And this time when it does go down, and it will go down, it's just a matter of time, it's going to take the entire planet with it, which uh, scares the hell out of me and should scare the hell out of anybody else, too. Mm -hmm. So what you're essentially seeing is a bubble more or less in fiat currencies and maybe derivatives in in that sense? Well, certainly currencies, derivatives, uh, the stock market, anything made out of paper is going to crash and burn. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's that's globally. and as I've said in my column a couple of times, the only country that's probably going to survive this with their financial and economic system intact is is Russia because they they have the best balance sheet of any central bank and any government in the on, in the on the world today. So it's uh, it's amazing to see that uh, they're being denigrated by everybody else, but uh, they hold the uh, all the financial cards as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've noticed the recent trend um, in the financial media with modern monetary theory talk growing. I wonder if you, if you're looking ahead, you know, what future market interventions or new economic theories we might see in the coming uh, decade. Well, it's now boiled down to that old axiom of which I heard I don't know ten or fifteen years ago on the internet. It's print or die, mm-hmm. and uh, we've reached that stage. First of all, I think it was um, it was uh, borrow and spend. And, and now it's got down to the point where it's print and spend because uh, there's just no other way to keep this financial system going mm-hmm. than just making money simply up out of thin air and printing it and spending it. And the fact that we've even got to this stage, um, as I said, I think it was in my Saturday column, you know, the ghost of John Law uh, from the 1700s or 1600s, whatever is in France, looms large over the financial and economic landscape of the world if they decide to go ahead with that monetary, modern monetary theory of making money up out of thin air. But that's where the world is headed if they do go in that direction. Now, I've watched your work over the years. You've been numerous times, I believe, to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. You've done various videos where you're trying to, you know, you're laying the case, putting out substantial evidence showing massive concentration of you know J.P. Morgan and other major commercial banks in the precious metals sector, I wonder what kind of feedback did you get from those videos, and you know whether in person or later on. I mean, what what, what did you hear back uh, in in retort? Well, you know, first of all, uh, all the work that I was presenting up there on the stage at all these various conferences I've been to Vancouver is you know based on everything that Ted has done, mm-hmm. and the, the the feedback I get is that. Um, a lot of people are going to those shows have been there before 
they've heard the word, they just want to come out and hear it again. And But the people who haven't heard it before are absolutely shocked that this is going on. And this concentrated short position by four U.S. banks, uh, which does not include J.P. Morgan right now, because according to Ted, they are actually long in the COMEX futures market in both gold and silver right now. And other banks have been left holding the uh, the short end of the stick in, in the commercial category. That includes Citigroup, HSBC USA, and here in Canada, our beloved Scotia Bank, which still has a short position in both those precious metals, plus a host of other uh, other banks as well, and both foreign and domestic. So this concentrated short position is um, is. Really bad. It's like a, like you just mentioned. The four the four largest and eight largest traders are short something like forty to forty five percent of the entire COMEX futures market in both gold and silver. And when you have that type of concentration in such a small group of of players, you know they control the price. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And just looking back, and just it was only a few years ago where silver kind of bottomed, I believe, at the end of twenty fifteen, and then did a run up to twenty one dollars. And Scotiabank got themselves, it seems like, into some trouble um, with their short position. And they've been trying to back out of their precious metal trading desk. Is there any news on that front that you've been seeing? It's certainly been very quiet on that front. Uh, uh, Ted figures they lost, Scotiabank lost between $500 million and $700 million in that price run up uh, mm -hmm. due to margin calls and things like that. You know, and, and as you correctly pointed out, you know, uh, Scotiabank uh, tried to shop uh, this Makata division around, and um, I think Citigroup and Goldman took a look at it and passed on it, rightly so. And um, then, then they decided they weren't going to sell it, and they were going to scale down the operation, which I'm sure they've done. And uh, But other than that, they've gone very quiet. But uh, there's certainly no doubt in my mind that uh, Scotiabank, even though they are no longer actively involved in the precious metals market from a COMEX future standpoint, still hold a very decent short position in both those precious metals, so they're not off the hook. Now, I'm sure, you know, you've done a lot of work with GATA over the years, and I'm sure you've seen some of their documentation of uh, the fact that on the COMEX, NYMEX, uh, foreign central banks are incentivized to, um, to trade uh, in commodity price discovery units, uh, whether that be in um, you know, crude oil or um, precious metals or other items that are physically uh, bought and sold in the world based on the pr prices that are discovered on those markets. I was wondering what uh, outside of precious metals do you think that this, you know, foreign central banks are operating in and helping to suppress the price of? Uh, in my opinion, um, I think Peter Warburton came out with an article back in 2001 where he said that the central banks are actively, central banks and, and brokerage houses like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, you know, they could control the commodity price complex by, you know, working in the derivatives market. I'm sure they're doing that. And there's no question about it. The CME group is offering these incentives to these same institutions so they'll actively go ahead and do exactly what you're saying. And uh, without doubt, that's that, that's actively going on right now. Um, besides the four precious metals, uh, it's my opinion that the um, the banks are involved in the crude oil market. And surprisingly enough, they're not involved in the copper market. If you look at the uh, bank participation report, which is coming out uh, on Friday, uh, and this has been going on for decades now. I think the banks are only like 1% or 2% of the COMEX futures market in copper, mm -hmm. which I find surprising considering it's such an important and crucial uh, primary uh, metal. Uh, so they're not involved in that market at all, but they, they're up to their necks in the precious metals and West Texas Intermediate Crude. And if you control those four commodities, you can pretty much control the prices of everything else, So, and that's what they're doing. Do you see any wild cards coming out of the East? I mean, we, we all know that Russia has been pretty transparent in the amount of gold bullion that they've been importing year on year. Uh, you know, the amount of gold they have basically makes their currency one of the most officially gold backed, theoretically, if they were to ever choose to do that with the ruble. Uh, and China, obviously, has been lying about their official reserves, slowly but surely raising it. But that's, you know, neither here nor there, 15 tons per month, et cetera. When you actually look at the physical gold flows going into China, most people who are watching uh, agree that, uh, you know, their official gold reserves are probably four to five times what they claim right now. I think they're claiming 1,900 tons, but most people would 
would say it's pretty safe to con- you know conservatively estimate they have ten thousand or more if they so choose. Um, are there any wild cards that you see out there in the future? Is it possible we could end up with a bifurcated monetary system with the West running some type of system and the East running their own? Well, that's that's certainly speculation. Uh, it's entirely possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and as far as Russia goes, I've already commented the fact that from a financial monetary situation, Russia, if they chose to do so, could certainly back the ruble with gold. They're in a position to do that. Mm-hmm. China's a different case, and I agree that they have multiples of the officially recorded amount. Like you said, 1,900 tons. Uh, I've seen seen numbers of 20,000 tons out Mm -hmm. there, Mm -hmm. and um, nobody really knows. Mm -hmm. I would be surprised if they didn't have equal to what the United States has by now. Mm -hmm. And like like I said in my column this morning, they're releasing the numbers in dribs and drabs like they did, what, 15 tons uh, in April. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that once in a while, every eight or nine or ten years or whatever, they come along and they declare their total gold holdings, so they jump it up by many hundreds of tons. And uh, I think uh, we'd be kind of shocked if we knew actually how much gold they got. I think that they have, like you said, far, far in excess of what they have now. Mm-hmm. And as far as what could set this whole thing off, well, I mean, take your pick. Uh, there's, I mean, Bolton and Pompeo are going around the world right now poking sticks into every hornet's nest they can find, trying to stir up trouble, whether it be in the Middle East or in Ukraine or Venezuela, pick a country that the United States isn't meddling in their affair, internal affairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Middle East is where the, it's, it, if there's something going to go bump in the night, it's going to be in the Middle East. And uh, Pompeo was in, was in Baghdad, I think, yesterday, mm-hmm. canceling his trip with, to see Merkel in Germany. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that when this thing finally does, when push becomes shove and something goes bump in the night, it's going to be in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Now, there's people, um, you know, in this industry who are saying the next decade to come should be very good. And even even naysayers about precious metal uh, price interventions like Jeff Christian are on record saying by 2022, you're going to have nominal new gold, new new record gold prices uh, for highs and silver will be threatening fifty dollars again in just a matter of a few years. What do you what are you thinking in terms of the coming decade? I mean, are you still, I presume, heavily invested in the sector? And, and what do you think uh, it's going to look like for the coming few years for the precious metals investors? Well, uh, as I tell my subscribers, and I've been telling them this for ten the last 10 or 15 years, I'm all in. I've been 100% invested in, in precious metals uh, since probably 2005 or 2006, something like that. Mm-hmm. I haven't sold a single solitary share or an ounce of anything. I've always added to my positions uh, when the prices are down. I intend to do so again this year if they're still low in the next couple of months. Um, This price management scheme will end only under two conditions if J.P. Morgan allows it because they are the kingpin in this and Ted Butler's been absolutely right and that was totally confirmed by Bart Chilton in that interview we were discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. So anybody who believes it isn't J.P. Morgan front and center at the this price management scheme, uh, if they say that they're not, then you can pretty much discredit everything else they have to say as well. Mm-hmm. Um, as to where the price could go, I have no idea. All I know is that both gold and silver will support very high numbers indeed when this price management scheme it comes to an end. And um, I've always thought that a three-digit silver price was certainly um, – doable easily and um, I, i'm sure that i know that ted agrees on that mm-hmm. and that as far as the gold price uh, boy that's everything speculation but i can tell you that it will be monstrously higher than it is today well ed i want to thank you on behalf of our listeners for coming on the show and um, i wanted to give you the chance to let them know how they can find you and, and go about seeing your work Oh, sure. I just, uh, my name is Ed Steer, spelled S-T-E-E-R, and my, my commentary is uh, Ed Steer's Gold and Silver Digest. They can just Google my name or Google the, uh, uh, my column name, and uh, the, the cost is U.S. $100 per year, and I write five columns a week. And uh, I appreciate you having me on the show, James. Yeah, sure thing. And I really do appreciate all the work you put into it. It's thorough. I've I've been reading it for years now. And every day, it's one of my go to emails that I read. And uh, you do a really good job of 
uh, going around the internet and picking up the precious metals news that's actually uh, valuable and leaving the chaff uh, on the floor, the stuff that's not important. So I do want to commend your work and, uh, you know, encourage listeners out there to give it a look. Thanks very much, James. All right, Ed. Thank you.